There are many debates you get into as a child. Arguments with your friends. Who's fastest? Who's strongest? Whose dad can beat up your dad, right? These are the debates we get into. But perhaps the most heated debate you'll get into as a child is, what's the greatest superhero power you can have? You ever had that? Mike Everson's had that argument before. Now, if you have that conversation with a kid in this generation, they'll go all weird on you. They'll talk about multiverse and time travel. That's not what I'm talking about. Back in my day, back when I used to walk to school in the snow, there was four abilities we would argue about. Super speed, super strength, invincibility, and my favorite, flight. Flight was the superior ability to all of those. Now, again, I know there was different practical physics that you would debate over which one was better than the other, but to me, flight just seemed fun. It was just fun. Like, who doesn't want to fly? And the person from my generation that really captured our imagination for flight was Peter Pan. Peter Pan made flying look fun. I understand Superman and Iron Man, but Peter Pan, I wanted to be invited to his party. That's all I know. So one day my son Justice comes home from school. He brings us his flyer, and it's fairy tale day. I'm like, man, what do you dress up a boy as? It's fairy tale day. And praise God, Peter Pan was on the list. So he chose Peter Pan. Look at how cute this picture is. That is a, that is a, sh a sharp, handsome boy. He wears it to his fairy tale day, but of course, this becomes his daily attire. And so he dresses up his younger sister, Farah, as Tinkerbell. And they would run around the house and throw pixie dust glitter on all of our furniture. That's just how it went, right? And one day I'm working up in my office. And here's what you have to understand. If, you, if you're a parent of boys, it's crazy all the time. Any parents of boys? God bless you parents of just girls. Like Francis would talk about how his girls would sit in the front row at church and so obedient. That's not how it is raising boys at all. So when you have girls play, they play quietly. Boys are loud. When it gets quiet, that's a bad sign as a parent of boys. And I'm upstairs, and Justice is loud and, and, and playing hyperly, right? And then all of a sudden it gets quiet, and I wait, and I wait. And I get up. I'm a bit concerned. As I'm walking towards the bedroom, I hear this giant bang, this crash, right? I run in, and you wait a second because if they immediately cry, it's okay. Delayed tears, that's a bad thing. Delayed tears happen. I'm like, oh no. So I rush in and there's Justice on the floor, blood in his hand, and his head is swollen. I said, Justice, what happened? He said, I tried to fly, Dad. <laughs> and look at the bed here. Let's look at the he jumps off the top of his sister's threshold of her bed and tries to fly and hits his head on that dresser. He's like, Dad, I guess my happy thoughts are broken. <laughs> that was it. Poor little man. He never jumped off the bed again. Important lesson. Important lesson that day. I love my son, Justin. We would always say his head always wins. He has the hardest head, both now becoming a teenager as well as when he was young. But see, our life as young kids is filled with these expectations, these dreams. We hope to be somewhere or be something when you're older. I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be a professional football player. That didn't work very long after high school hit. But we have these dreams, and our life is having these dreams and expectations collide. Where a lot of these expectations become massive disappointments. And there's a really key verse in Proverbs 13, 12. It says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a, de a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. See, that word deferred means delayed or to be stretched out. And for many of us, we've had those disappointments. Or you've had expectations. You really thought... God was going to do something, your job would go here, and you're met with disappointment. Anybody with me? And it says it creates this soul sickness. And I've seen that these last few years where more people have had disappointments and discouragement, and this soul sickness starts to settle in and turns into bitterness. Now, the word that the Hebrew uses here, they paint beautiful pictures with their words. Sickness literally means an incurable affliction. And I've seen this in the hearts of many people these last couple of years where you've been in the midst of brokenness. You've been in the midst of breaking and you're at a loss for words. And see, there's really no adequate words that we can use to describe the emotional state of those 11 disciples on the Friday of Passover in 33 AD. When they stared at their Messiah, their rabbi, their teacher, murdered on a cross. 
And as they were there in despair, not knowing what to do, as they were at a loss, this was the one that was going to bring the kingdom. This was the one that was going to fulfill all the expectations of the Messiah. And now he's dead, hanging there. Their best friend Judas has betrayed him, and now he's committed suicide. Not knowing what to do, one of the disciples offers and says, please, let us have the body and give an honorable burial. They take the body, place it in a tomb. This day of mourning for these 11 disciples. However, it was a day of celebration for two groups called the Pharisees and Sadducees. See, these two groups, they were bitter rivals. They would never be in the same room. But that day was a day of celebration because their common enemy, Jesus, was put to death. It was the first Passover in three years in which they actually went to bed in peace because he was gone. See, now when we talk about these two rival groups, we often think of Democrat and Republican, right? That's our, our clearest perspective. But here's what you want to understand. They shared the same God, Yahweh, but had massive interpretations on how you would worship him. So they were bitter rivals. So on that night, they celebrated. The next day, they wake up, and they want to make sure that this tomb is secure. So they send out messengers, and they say, hey, to the Roman guard, we want to make sure the tomb's secure, that no one steals this body. So they send these guards. They, they watch it, and everything's fine. Everything's peaceful. Things are going back to normal. Now they can be bitter rivals again. About 50 days pass. Things have finally seemed to calm down, but they hear about this disturbance that takes place in the city of Jerusalem around the time of Pentecost, the Feast of Booths. So as they're trying to investigate what's taking place, it turns out that these disciples of Jesus are baptizing in the name of Jesus, saying that he's risen from the dead. They're confused by this. They don't know how to answer it. In addition, they're speaking in strange tongues. This is unusual. So one day when traveling to the temple, they crossed the Gate Beautiful. Here's what the Gate Beautiful would actually look like in modern day. Do we have that picture? This is the gate, the beautiful gate. As they're walking there, there's this giant crowd, and there's Peter, the leader of these disciples, declaring that Jesus has risen from the dead. As they see him, they go to stop the commotion. They're confronted by this man who was crippled and claims to be healed. Not knowing what to do, they seize Peter, and they say, how are you doing this? This is Acts chapter 4, verse 7. Then they brought Peter before them and began to question him, by what power or what name are you doing this? Verse 10. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands healed today. As he confronts them, they don't know what to do. They seize him, and they warn him, if you speak of this again, you'll regret it. Peter and John walk away with smiles on their face because they count suffering worthy of their Savior's death. As they walk back, they think that they can settle things. The Sanhedrin doesn't know what to do. The Pharisees and Sadducees are gathering together now again because they have a new problem. It's not just one man. It's this whole group of disciples again. Things continue to take place where now they're not just seeing one or two people get healed. They're bringing groups of people to get healed, Acts chapter 5. So a crowd gathers together in all the towns of Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by impure spirits. And all of them were healed, verse 17. Then the high priest and all of his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Here's what we have to understand. If you were sick... You would have to go before them, and you would have to give offerings. That's how they made their money. So all of a sudden, their pocketbooks are hit by these miracles. This is a financial and economic problem. Guess what's going to happen, church, when all the sick get healed and the hospitals are empty? Uh-oh. Financial problem, church. They're filled with jealousy. So they arrest the apostles and put them in jail. Not knowing what to do, they gather together, and this rabbi named Gamaliel stands up and says, we need to stop this. We need to stop. Now, there was two rival schools of Pharisees at the time. The rabbi Gamaliel was more of a peacemaker. So N.T. Wright says, Gamaliel's philosophy would be live and let live. So he sees this, and, he's, and he goes through all these other insurrections. He says, remember that all these things failed. All these other attempts of Messiah, they failed. So let's not mess with this, because if this is God, you ain't going to be able to stop it. Now, here was the problem. His successor was one of the most zealous Pharisees of that time. 
and heard this, and it created this split in the camp. See, there was another rabbi who had died right before this named Rabbi Shammai, and this was his statement. Say your prayers, sharpen your swords. This split the camp massively. They take Peter and John. They go to find them. They're out of prison. They've escaped, claiming an angel set them free. They're preaching in the temple courts again. They grab them, beat them, send them back. They're distraught. However, this young Pharisee of Gamaliel takes matters into his own hands. They have a new problem now. Miracles are not being performed just by the apostles. They're happening by those younger than them, in particular this man named Stephen. They're in the temple courts again, and here's Stephen praying for people to get healed. They get healed, and he begins to declare to all the Pharisees, you're the one that murdered Jesus. Oh, this was not going well. Acts chapter 7, verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Saul approved of his execution. Saul was that young successor of Gamaliel. And he took matters into his own hands. Now, here's the problem with this verse. They did not have jurisdiction for execution. They were not allowed to do that. That's why there was that giant ceremony over crucifying Jesus. You had to have Roman approval. But for Saul, this was a holy war. He was there to fulfill the will of Yahweh and stop these insurrectionists. So as he's there, he approves of this execution. Now, although Saul was young, his resume could not be rivaled. Saul was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, he was faultless. No one can match Saul's resume. So Saul took it into his own hands to end this, Acts 8.1. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And all were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering the house after house. And he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. This was unusual. He's literally destroying families. Most likely within these verses, he's murdering them without lawful jurisdiction. We find this later on in his resume. And as he's splitting up these homes and separating these children, he says, I want approval to be able to kill at my will. And so he sets out and rides to Damascus on a donkey or a horse, we don't know. But as he's riding there, he encounters a light. And he sees this light, and it blinds him and knocks him off his horse, Acts 9, 3. And as he went on his way and approached the city, this light shone from heaven. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Now, here's what we don't understand. We're so used to that phrase, Lord. That's the term kyrios, which would be the phrase for Yahweh in Greek. He says, are you Yahweh? Are you you the one that I worship? And he says, no, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. This is a big statement. Saul doesn't know what to do. His companions grab him. They lead him to the city because here's the problem. They heard the voice but didn't see anything. Now Paul, Saul is blind. As they lead him back to the city, he doesn't know how to see. The Spirit of God speaks to this prophet named Ananias. This is one of the shortest passages of a hero we find in the New Testament. And this prophet named Ananias is praying one day. Could you imagine that quiet time? You get your coffee. I know you get your coffee. You get your Bible. You put on your headphones. You're all set up. Holy Spirit, what do you have for me today? I want you to go pray for Saul. He says, what? See, he knew exactly who Saul was. Saul probably murdered some of Ananias' friends. I want you to go and pray for the greatest enemy in the city. Here's what I believe happened. Ananias, I believe, replied like Sweet Baby Brown of Oklahoma City in 2013. Ain't nobody got time for that. Did you like that, Sean? He shook his head at me for that one. Got to bring levity somehow in the halfway of the message. So Ananias says yes to Jesus. How do you recover from that one, right? Ananias says yes to Jesus. Walks in. 
And there's Saul. He says, the Spirit of God sent me to pray for you. And Saul's there, and as he prays, it says scales fall from his eyes. Here's what we have to understand. God will send you to people that don't deserve your prayers in your mind. And when you think about 2 Corinthians 2 and 4, when it says the God of this age has blinded the eyes of those who are unbelieving, think how different now Paul writes that. See, we're praying for scales to fall from the eyes of those that are blind. We're believing for God to open the minds and the eyes of unbelievers. So Saul's there, these scales fall, and Ananias doesn't run. He baptizes him. His greatest enemy. Think about that journey of forgiveness Ananias had to walk through. He forgives Paul and baptizes him and receives him. Now you're the guy that's got to go tell everybody that this guy's different. <laughs> Doesn't work very well. Ananias then goes with Paul and everybody rejects him because, listen, this is the one that's been ravaging the church. They think it's a trick and they think Ananias is a fool for bringing him. Paul doesn't know what to do. His name is then converted to Paul, honestly, because his resume as Saul was not a good one. Changes his name to show his transformation. Now, for us, if you read the book of Acts, you would assume Saul becomes Paul and now goes on the preaching circuit. Paul now has a marquee. He has a social media page. He probably has a self-help book. He's getting everything together. Your transformation today, right? That's Paul's motives. That's not what happens. It says in Galatians, he gives this detailed list that we often overlook. He says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him for 15 days. He has this 15-day discipleship course with Peter. And guess what Peter says? Go back to your house. That's not what Paul wanted to hear. Peter sends him back to Tarsus, where he's been abandoned by his family, most likely divorced. If you don't understand that, but he was. His kids have abandoned him, and he's by himself. This doesn't last for three, four years. It lasts for 14 years. Galatians 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus. See, Paul experienced rejection like we don't understand. You're the murderer of Christians, and now, because you are a Christian, you're no longer a son of Abraham. He's a living tragedy. One pastor writes this. Seven to ten years later, Paul was still riding God's bench in Tarsus, waiting in the wings. By then he was in his mid-40s, had probably been ostracized by his family and suffered expulsion from the synagogue. As he waited, the world and indeed the missionary mandate seemed to be passing him by. Anybody ever feel like that before? He worked in his trade as a tent maker, sitting and knitting a tent, and he was called to do so much more. Paul then goes up, meets the apostles. He's commissioned by Jesus' brother James. And as he's sent out, broken and bewildered, he comes across this church a few years later called the Church of Corinth. We know them as the Corinthians. How many have been to dysfunctional church before? You're like, I'm in one right now, right? No. <laughs> the Corinthians win the belt for most dysfunctional church. It's not even close. What you don't understand is we have two letters to the Corinthian church. There was most likely four. Paul references two other letters in these and they're both letters of correction. This was a jacked up church. Really bad. So as he writes to them, they say, we don't want you as our apostle. We want Apollos. He speaks better than you. Literally, they say, you're boring in the Greek. I'm not kidding you. And as he replies, <laughs> he says, let me give you my resume. Let's see how Paul leads. See, Paul is not met by parades and celebrations. When he says yes to the call of Jesus, it's yes to a life of hardship and despair. Five times 
the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Why? Because 40 you were deemed dead. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I faced danger from men whom claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I've been hungry and thirsty. And often have gone without food. I have shivered in the cold with enough, without enough clothing to keep warm, often naked. See, our image of Paul in modern church culture is this hero that is handsome. A few years ago, there was rumors that Hugh Jackman was going to play Paul in a movie. And this image circulated around. The reality is, Paul would look nothing like that. He probably looked like this. In all honesty, this is not an exaggeration. See, we have other historical documents beyond the Gospels. Now, they're not canon, but they're historical. And there's a book written in the first or second century called the Acts of Paul, where they would take letters written about Paul and record them. Here's what one of them say. Paul, a man, small in size, bald-headed, bandy-legged, well-built, with eyebrows meeting together. That's a kind way to say unibrow, genuinely. <laughs> Rather long-nosed, but full of grace. How kind is that last title? <laughs> when you think of a man that underwent that type of beating, we're talking about a war veteran with PTSD, abandoned and broken. And that's who Jesus picks to save him. I want him. The most qualified now disqualified. The most accepted now abandoned. I want him to be my main messenger throughout the entire world. That 2,000 years later we still talk about. That's the guy who says, I picked. See, in modern church we have this broken perceptive perspective. Whatever word. Oh, look at you. Look at Austin. There you go. This perspective of performance that we live under. And we walk into the most sanitized Sundays in any church in the modern history. And the idea of church is anything but biblical in modern day. We have to understand our Savior was born in a barn. And for us, we, we come in with our broken lives and our broken marriages, and there's things I would love to share about my journey, but I just want to say this in advance. This needs to be a safe place for my kids. You have to understand that. So I know many people have had questions about my experience and my journey. You could talk to Sean or others about those things. This place needs to be a place for my kids, and that's why I don't talk about it from this stage. I just want to give you a heads up on that. So beyond that, we come in with our, all of our dysfunction and our fights, and we see this perfect lighted stage and microphones. And we live in this modern church continuum of perfection and performance. And we live under this pressure that this creates. And we wonder why the world wants nothing to do with us. I can't tell you how many times it finally comes out that I'm a pastor. If you ever meet me in public and you introduce me to a friend, do not tell them I'm a pastor. Do not. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's how you change a relationship with somebody who doesn't know the Lord. So you give them a title. So when I meet people and they finally find out I'm a pastor, they say, hey, if I ever come to your church one day, hopefully I don't blow up. I, I promise you, that's a regular thing I hear. Because that's the perspective we have is this place that will not accept them. And we have a Jesus and a Paul that entered the house of sinners. That's why we're building house churches, church. Because they'll never step into that building, but they will go to your home. And so, what really what God wants us to hold the tension of, and this is where the power comes in, is we have this continuum that we're called to live out of belief and brokenness. And when you hold the tension of belief and brokenness, we find the beauty of God. That's what the Lord calls beautiful. That's what he calls beautiful. 
When you say, Jesus, here's my brokenness. Here's my inadequacy. Here's my insufficiency. I'm going to offer it to you. Can you hold it? It's time to stop burying your brokenness. This is your offering to the Lord. This is your alabaster box like that young prostitute held and broke at the feet of Jesus. He calls it beautiful and rememorable. And when Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians, as a broken, battered man who did not speak well, that functioned in the power of the Holy Spirit, it gives a better picture to this. We have this treasure in jars of clay so that it may be made clear that the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from up for us. Josh and Christina, come forward quickly. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in our body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus may be visible in our bodies. As he goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, as he asked the Lord three times to remove his thorn from the flesh, which I do not believe was sickness, but his opposition, and there's great proof of that. Jesus replies, my grace is sufficient, for my power is perfected in weakness. Church, if we're going to see a move of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be through weak and broken people, not experts and professionals. This is our call. Hold your applause. We'll applaud for them in a minute. Uh, after they're done sharing. But my friends here have invited the Lord and said yes to the call of God in one of the most painful ways pro po possible. They've said yes to the Lord, and I've seen God's favor on their life in the midst of pain. Let's clap. Josh, Christina, Marlowe, here we go. Thank you. Uh, my name's again Josh. This is my wife, Christina, and we've been married now for almost 18 years. So... <laughs> It's a miracle, I know. Um, shortly after we got married, we had some friends that we respected a lot come over to our place and say, hey, we are going to adopt from Ethiopia. And we were like, well, that's interesting. Tell us more about that. And they explained you know, what the process was like for them and why they were doing it, choosing to go that route over having biological children, which was interesting. It planted some seeds in our heart at that point. And we didn't really talk about it too much right then, but over the next couple of months, it came up again, and we started to both realize that God wanted us to do this. God was calling us to adopt. And at the time, we knew that we had that call, but we also were operating in this, um, in this realm of we still knew what was best for us and what that meant, what that would look like, you know, setting parameters around it. So we knew that um, we were terrified that if we had a child place in our home that if they were taken from us and, and reunited with their parents, that that would devastate us, that we wouldn't be able to handle that. So we knew, okay, we're not doing foster adopt. No way, not happening. And we are probably not doing private adoption either because we'd heard some stories where that had gone south. So not doing that. So that left international. So okay, all right, all right, we're going to go international adoption. Because that's very easy. Because very easy, yes. We knew we wanted a baby, you know, as close to a baby as possible because of all of the studies showing developmentally, you know, the earlier you get them, the more you love them, the better they are, right? So we knew, okay, it has to be a baby, has to be from overseas, only one. Only one. We're, not doing, we're not doing multiple at a time. You know, we knew, we, we knew we wanted to adopt three, we thought at the time. We're going to do one biological and adopt three. That was the plan. Plan everything out, right? <laughs> and, so, and so we start down this process. We do, you know, we go biological first. So the day before our son Luke is born, we submit all the paperwork that we need to so that we are officially in the process to adopt from Ethiopia. And at the time, they say this is about an 18-month to two-year process before you're going to be matched and be able to, you know, bring home a baby. So, like, perfect. Works great with our plans. This is exactly, every, everything's working exactly the way that it's supposed to. And we get through that first year of waiting, and, you know, the, the agency is constantly sending updates of everyone who's being matched with the kids. The kids are coming home. You're getting, oh, great, great. We're moving up the queue. It's almost, you know, it's going to be our turn soon. And right about that year mark, 
is when rumors start coming out that things are slowing down in Ethiopia because of corruption. There were babies being sold into slavery, people that were buying them and, and taking them internationally and putting them into bad places. And it caused a lot of heartache for us. You know, we don't want that happening to babies, but it also slowed down the process significantly where the government was getting involved and saying, hey, we need to, to get this corrected. And so it came to an almost complete halt where there were no more stories coming in of babies. Or if, there was, if, if someone was, it was very, very rare that we would hear that that was happening. So after two years of waiting, we say, okay, we don't want a big gap between our kids, so we go biological again. So Eliana is then comes to be in our family. And then three years goes by, four years goes by. We get into the fifth year, and the whole country closes completely. And they say, there is no more international adoption coming out of this country. And we're like, okay, okay. I mean, and we're waiting that whole time, thinking, like, when is this going to happen? Like, we feel like God has called us to do this. We're supposed to be doing this. And when the door closes, we're like, God, did we hear you correctly? Is this what we're supposed to be doing? Are we supposed to be adopting and, and praying about it and thinking about it, talking about it? We're like, yes, we are supposed to adopt. But internationals close. We look at all the other countries, and at that point, it's seven-year waits. It's, you know, five-year waits. You know, it's, you know, for a healthy child, you're not, you're not looking at any kind of short time frame. So internationals now closed. We don't have the funds for private adoption in the U.S. at that point. And that leaves one door, the, one, the first one that we had closed, right? Foster to adopt. And so we say, okay, God, we are going to try this. So we put in our paperwork for that, go through the home study. This is August, August of after, the, after five years. We do that in August. In September, we start getting calls from the adoption agency that we're using with potential matches. In October, they say, hey, we have got a sibling set. We know you only wanted one, but we've got a sibling set. One's two, the other's a baby, and we're thinking, okay, this could work. This could work, you know, with, our, with the ages of our kids. Um, but th that's all they know. We don't know if they're boys, girls. We don't know anything about them. And so they say, okay, well, here's the house of the current foster placement they're in. You can go check them out. And so we go to meet them, and the first boy we meet, he's almost three, full of energy, awesome, seems like a happy kid, but he knows five words at three years, almost three years old. He knows five words. The other boy, the baby, is 15 months, bigger than the almost three-year-old. <laughs> no baby, won't make eye contact, drooling, can't crawl. Like, he can't even crawl at this point. For those who know, at 15 months, you should be moving, right? And so we do a couple more visits with them. The social worker is like, hey, th there might be some, some issues here, special needs with the youngest one. We don't know. Um, but we say, you know what? When we were praying about it, talking about it, we say, God, if it's meant to be, if this is who we're supposed to have, it will work out. Whether, whether And we're going to trust that they are going to develop the way they're supposed to. If they don't, we, this, if that's who we're supposed to have, that's who we're supposed to have. At this point, we're changing our whole tune of being in control and saying, this is who it's supposed to be. So I'll let Christina take over. Yeah, so anyway, we ended up with the opposite of what we said, um, but it was honestly the best thing that ever happened to us. The hardest season, for sure, that we had to walk through. Um, but talking about the breaking is breaking off the things you thought things were going to look like when you walk into a call and accepting what it's actually going to look like. And there was a lot of chaos, and you'd often hear people say, well, like, you just follow God and just follow that peace. And where God is, there will be peace. Well, where God is in foster care, there's often, or adoption, there's often a lot of chaos and heartache and trauma. It's not all peace, um, but God's still there. So God's in you with it um, in the chaos. And we saw God come through even when we felt like we were breaking, our marriage was breaking, our kids were breaking, I was breaking. We thought, we, we're not going to make it through this. Like, the kids are probably going to be reunified. Ours was a reunification case, so we knew that they were going to be going back to their birth parents, but we still were like, can we come out of this okay at the end? We don't know. But we saw God come through in such an incredible way. Through our community, people would drop meals off, text us encouragement, come and say, we're going to watch your kids so you can just spend time together. Um, so don't underestimate when God puts someone on your heart to reach out to them. That it, it could be the difference between 
them feeling hopeless and giving them hope. Um, and also something else that was so important is being in community. Our biological daughter um, at one point had kind of shut down because the older boy was very chaotic and aggressive and all the things. So she had kind of gone from being very fun loving and social to quiet and withdrawn. And I thought like, she's not coming out of this. I can't pay attention to my other kids because we're focused on these kids who have all these needs and therapy appointments and all the things. Um, and we were at a community group meeting and one of the leaders came up to me after and said, you have a daughter, right? I said, yeah. He said, I saw her playing by herself in her room and I felt like God wanted me to tell you that even though you're not able to play with her, Jesus is playing with her. And that was what got me through that season of feeling like I was neglecting so many of my kids because there was so much going on is I knew God was with us even in the messy, in the broken, in the chaos. And that's where in your community, when you feel like you don't have faith for something, they'll have faith for you. When, we, when you feel like you can't pray for something, they're going to pray it for you because you don't feel like you can in that season because you're so, you're in that dark place. And when you feel like you can't even hear God's voice because there's so much going on, they're going to hear it for you and speak that into your life. So if you're not in community, I just want to encourage that because that's what got us through um, this crazy season. And uh, I want to um, take this opportunity. If you're a foster or adoptive parent, can you just stand up really quick? I know there's some of you in here. Please stand up. We want to honor you guys. And I just want to pray. Um, if you can extend your hands to them, please. Extend your hands to these um, families. Put your hands on them if you're nearby. God, we lift up these couples, these families who have said yes when other people didn't want to say yes to broken things. They gave away the thought of having a normal family or normal kids, and they said yes to different, and that's okay. Different is beautiful. And I pray for their marriages, God, that you would strengthen them. We pray for their families, all of their children, God, that you will knit them together in a way that we can't see and we didn't know was possible. We pray for their futures, God, that you are raising up these men and women uh, to be lights in the world and touch areas that we're never going to walk in this church, but they're going to be influencers, God, for your kingdom. We thank you for them. We pray a blessing over these families and parents, God, and thank you for their yes, because that yes was hard and it cost something. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just stand together as a church. I invite the prayer team forward. We're really over time. We're going to be all right. We're going to make it work. Prayer team, come forward. We're going to honor our children's ministry as well. So we give this precaution. If you do need prayer and you have kids in children's ministry, please go up and get them if you can. Uh, and then bring them back for prayer. Holy Spirit, we thank you again for what you're doing in this church. As you're meeting us in brokenness. As you're meeting us in the dark places. God, we touched on a lot of things today. We ask for the spirit of trauma to leave in Jesus' name. Just with eyes closed around the room, there, there have been deep betrayals you've experienced. Relationships that were meant to protect you violated you. Lord, I pray for healing right now. I'm not going to expose that. God, would you come and bring healing and restoration? the broken and the weary. God, would you strengthen the hurting heart? Show your truth, your grace, your mercy. Today you're here and you say, you know what, there's been some, some brokenness I've buried and I need to offer the Lord. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we just pray. Come now, Holy Spirit. Strengthen the weary heart. Strengthen those in need. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you for my brothers. Thank you for my sisters. Those online right now, meet them in their living rooms. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.